Good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the finale of three Ulam lectures presented by Sam Bowles on how we got to be nasty and nice. The Ulam lectures are dedicated to the memory of mathematician Stanislav Ulam, who epitomized the kind of interdisciplinary research now conducted at the Santa Fe Institute long before the Institute was founded. I would also like to thank Dr. Penelope Penland for her generous support of the Ulam Lecture Series. And I would also like to note that her training is in psychology, and she has taken it upon herself to fund the kinds of lectures that have a psychological bent. And if anyone is interested in other types of research and isn't so inclined, um, I'm going to make a very, uh, a very, uh, yeah, a pitch. Um, for anyone who would like to, to contribute to the Santa Fe Institute to, to support such lectures. A small notice, many of you may also be regular attendees of Santa Fe Public Lecture Series, and I have been asked to let you know that the public lectures in October and November will not be at the regular Wednesday times. Franz De Waal from Emory University will be talking about our inner ape on Tuesday, October 7th, and Dan Gilbert from Harvard University We'll talk about stumbling on happiness on Monday, November 17th. Tonight's lecture is the third and grand finale of three lectures by Sam Bowles. Sam Bowles is a professor of the Santa Fe Institute where he heads the behavioral sciences program. He is also a professor of economics at the University of Siena. Sam earned his bachelor's degree at Yale in 1960 and then went to Harvard to earn his PhD in economics. So if you remember in his first lecture, he talked about worthless academic credentials as a kind of signal of an otherwise, and I quote, unobservable trait that is desirable in a co-producer or coalition partner. I think Sam knew what he was talking about. So in his first lecture, uh, well, Sam also taught economics at Harvard from 1965 to 1973 at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he is now Professor Emeritus. In his first lecture on, on Tuesday night, Sam described the unique kind of large-scale cooperation observed among humans and why it cannot simply be explained in terms of such commonly proposed arguments as kin selection, self-interest with a long-term time horizon, or what we simply fear someone is watching us. In his second lecture last night, Sam took up the problem of explaining why humans might have such a unique propensity to cooperate focusing on the coevolution of two kinds of behavior, altruism on the one hand and parochialism on the other. In these lectures, Sam has exemplified the kind of research that makes you SFI such a unique place to do work. As many of you might know, academia is a place that, if not characterized by altruism, is at least parochial. <laughs> Anthropologists have their own departments, journals, conferences, and canons. Economists, sociologists, and psychologists have their own. I haven't even mentioned physicists because I'm parochial myself. In his own work, Sam has fought hard to break down these barriers. Consider the collaboration of four economists and 12 anthropologists he described in his Tuesday night lecture. Four economists and 12 anthropologists walk into a bar. <laughs> in many circles, this sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. But Sam and his colleagues made it a productive model of research and as a result, have reinvigorated the field of cross-cultural behavioral studies. The range of collaborations required to collect and interpret the data presented in the last two lectures is astounding. Sam has digested ethnography, experimental data, archival research, hypothetical histories, game theoretic deduction, genetics, archaeological data, and a preponderance of evidence, if you remember, on how people dispatched one another in prehistoric times. Recall it's a broken ulna and not a radius that indicates violent conflict. In his previous two lectures, Sam has argued that we are not always knaves, and he has proposed an explanation for this. Sometimes I think Sam's deeper motivation to study this topic is that he doesn't feel like a knave, and he doesn't like other economists telling him that he is. Whether or not we are nasty or nice is very interesting from a scientific perspective. But in the scheme of things, why does it really matter whether we are knaves or not? Why does it matter for policy or for how we build societies or design governments? Tonight's lecture is going to take on that challenge. 
from Sam's record as a reformer, and not just an academic reformer, but one who has fought the loyalty oath at Harvard in the 1960s, who debated Milton Friedman and Gary Becker, prominent Chicago school economists about free markets on public television during the Reagan era, and who has served as an economic advisor to Jesse Jackson, Robert Kennedy, Nelson Mandela, and the International Labor Organization, I suspect this is where his heart really lies. And I look forward to hearing what he has to tell us. Well, thank you all for thank you all for coming and uh, bearing with me this difficult and uh, demanding topic. Uh, it's actually more this topic today. What I'll be talking about today is more demanding than you might think. The first draft of what I'm talking about tonight, I wrote in 1988, the same title. Uh, and uh, I presented it at the philosophy department at University College London. It was well received by them, but not by me. Uh, but something did come of it because it was about that time that I met my wife. And she told me later that uh, that was one of the reasons why she fell in love with me, that paper. <laughs> now, of course, that worried me a lot. Because <laughs> I, I keep hoping there was something else, you know. <laughs> uh, what, you, what you see before you is a, a beautiful fresco, uh, which is on the town hall uh, in uh, Siena, Italy. And uh, this is a painting in 1338. Remember, that's, that's uh, 200 years before Machiavelli. Uh, in which Lorenzetti tried to portray what a good society would look like. It's a massive fresco, and this is just a small detail. But what is absolutely striking about it is it's entirely secular. Uh, it, uh, it conveys uh, the idea of people going about their business in a well-ordered way, peacefully, productively, and so on. And so at this time, as at so many times, not only in Europe but in other parts of the world, we've been troubled by how best are we to organize our lives so that we can live peacefully and productively together. Now, I want to review a couple of things that we've already established, I think. These are things which I would show a little picture of the hammer, not the ristra. We are a uniquely cooperative species. We join with large numbers of others, including non-kin, in the pursuit of projects for mutual benefit. A lot of many aspects and some of the key aspects of these cooperative activities that we, we engage in cannot be explained by the self-interest paradigm or the somebody may be looking idea. Part of the explanation is because many of us are altruistic much of the time. I provided experimental evidence for that. And yet yesterday I outlined a rather improbable hypothetical history which I think actually happened, and that is that we became this way altruistic because of a coevolutionary process in which both leveling, egalitarian leveling and warfare played an essential part. Today we're going to ask how can we use this knowledge to improve the way we govern our local, national and global interactions, whether in government or in business or in communities, uh, so that we can provide a flourishing and sustainable life for all humans. But I don't want to start on this. Uh, I want you to recall that last night I, I started you on, that, I know, you have, this, you have this thing in front of you, so you're not allowed to go and turn the pages, right? Uh, uh, I told you about this um, problem the daycare centers in Haifa are having, parents coming late to pick up their kids. And uh, I told you that they posted a little sign that said, as of Monday, uh, if you come late, you'll pay a fine. And, of course, being good at scientists, there was actually an experimental economist involved, two of them, uh, they recorded before this thing started uh, how late the various groups were. This is the group that had the fine. That was the control group, which would have no fine. And the fine starts there. Um, and uh, you've probably spent some time wondering what happened. Uh, now, what happened actually is one of the most interesting things 
uh, that we've discovered in experimental economics. And if you wonder why I'm now willing to publish this work when I wasn't 20 years ago or any time in between, it's because of this fabulous outpouring of experimental work which really nailed down some of the speculations that I had back in 1988 which I was dealing with more or less mathematically in terms of sociological and psychological insight, but I was modeling it, but I just didn't have the goods. Now I think we do. But let me begin with Aristotle. Lawmakers make the citizen good by inculcating habits in them. And this is the aim of every lawgiver. If he does not succeed in doing that, his legislation is a failure. It is in this that a good constitution differs from a bad one. Not this is one of the things you would like to see in a good constitution. This is the measure against which constitutions should be evaluated. This tradition that, that we should re regard the problem of good governance as a problem of somehow cultivating a good citizenry was an essential part of the Aristotelian idea, and it continued on in Europe up until about the 15th or 16th century. In, at which time, sorry to skip over quite a bit of time there, but, uh, oh, not only that, I'm imposing a little bit of Italian on you. Um, Machiavelli said, um, uh, for anyone, I'll translate the Italian, for, for anyone who would like to uh, order a republic, uh, uh, it is necessary to suppose that all men are wicked. Hunger and poverty make them industrious, and laws make them good. Uh, that's from his uh, discourses. Now, notice, Machiavelli, a genius of political science, did not say that the laws were to make the citizens be good. In fact, his idea in the discourses and in The Prince, his more famous book, was that the laws should induce the citizens somehow, though bad that they are, wicked. In fact, uh, they should be induced to act as if they were good. And this then became the standard philosophical and political practical problem that the great philosophers, uh, initially Marsilio Padua, uh, uh, another Italian obviously, but this was of course then uh, taken up by uh, Hobbes uh, and Hume, who we're going to hear from again today, Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, and the great thinkers of the uh, um, European philosophical tradition. Interestingly, the person who really expressed this idea was Bernard Mandeville. He was a Dutch doctor by training. He lived in London. And in 1705, he wrote this book, Fable of the Bees. Of the bees? Why of the bees? Because what he was saying was at odds with the Aristotelian tradition, which of course was the same tradition as St. Thomas Aquinas and so on. He wanted to argue something absolutely at odds with them. And had he said that his book was about human society, he would have scandalized his readers. So he wrote about a hive of bees. He said every part was full of vice, yet the whole mass of paradise. Such were the blessings of that state, their crimes conspired to make them great. There was a hive of bees who were nasty little animals, and yet somehow the hive worked pretty well. And at a certain point, they got religion, and they all turned virtuous, and the economy of the hive crashed, and everything went to hell. Uh, <laughs> but before the religion had struck them, the worst of all, the multitude did something for the common good. And his subtitle of a later edition, actually, was Human Frailties May Be Turned to the Advantage of Civil Society and Made to Supply the Place of Moral Virtue. Now, I want you to remember that. There's a substitution here, right? In place of virtue, we're going to take shabby motives and we're going to somehow allow them, liberate them, channel them, so that they convert these shabby motives into valued objectives. In the first lecture I mentioned this, I called it the alchemy of economics, which turns ordinary selfish motives into socially valuable outcomes. In the first lecture, I quoted more extensively, but I'm sure some of you remember, but I'm mentioning this again because a few of you were not here on uh, the first night. In contriving any system of government, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave. That's very much like Machiavelli. But it fell to Bentham, the founder of the utilitarianism, in his famous duty and interest uh, junction principle, he said, 
in, in designing how to organize a government, we should try uh, to make it each man's interest to observe that, contact, uh, that conduct which it is his duty to observe. So there are some duties which we would like our public servants to carry out. Our job is not to make them moral, committed to doing the duty, but rather to provide them with incentives so that their private interests will be to execute the duty which we would impose on them. Now, Adam Smith's invisible hand famously showed how self-interest, not, as he said, as I quoted two nights ago, the benevolence of the butcher. It is self-interest, not the benevolence, which will put the meat on the table. Smith's fantastic idea is this. Let prices do the work of morals. That's the substitution. Mandeville didn't quite get it. Mandeville is not an economist. He didn't figure out that there was actually a way that the worst of all the multitude could do something for the common good, and that is by designing a system of private property and com competition so that the prices would be such that people, out of self-interest, would implement an outcome which would be, in a certain sense, a social order which one could defend. Now, Smith didn't really have it fully worked out, but the idea resonated. I think it is, by the way, the single most radical and most profound idea in the social sciences ever, ever written down. Uh, it's quite counterintuitive. I have a very hard time teaching my introductory students that it actually might work. The people who showed that it actually would work were Arrow and De Brewer, Kenneth Arrow, uh, one of the or original participants in the Santa Fe Institute, a uh, active participant to this day. Uh, he founded, with some others, the economics program there. Um, Ken Arrow proved um, what is now called the invisible hand theorem, and it showed the conditions under which Adam Smith's conjecture would be correct. The secret, which was discovered by uh, Arrow and De Brewer, made clear by them, is very simple. The invisible hand works if everything that goes on between us that we care about in some interaction is owned. It's owned by me, and then I exchange it with you, and then you own it. In other words, if property rights are well-defined, the invisible hand works. Uh, and uh, now, you say, why do you need a theorem for that? Well, it's actually a, it's a very profound theorem to show that that is the condition, and if that's the condition, then a competitive economy will reach an outcome which is, in a certain sense, efficient. Um, now, <clears throat> the way this works is that prices induce me to act as if I care about the costs that I might inflict on you or the benefits that I might incur on you. Um, and so that, for example, if property rights are well-defined and I inflict a cost on you, for example, by driving my car into your, into your uh, house or something, then there are liability rules which say I have to pay you. So, in other words, the things which economists call spillovers, that is, things that I do that may inflict either a cost or a benefit on you, should be taken account of in a good contractual system. And when those contracts are all in place, everything that matters is owned, and we're exchanging these things which we own according to well-defined rules of ownership and liability, uh, then it means every actor out of his or her own self-interest will take account of the effect of the actions on the others, and then the invisible hand works. Well, Mandeville's idea was that the right institutions, he had in mind, incentives for the self-interest, are capable of implementing socially desirable outcomes. And notice the last three words, irrespective of preferences. There's nothing here about how people have to be good, bad, or anything. Uh, that's really remarkable. We can actually have a good outcome with prices that essentially do the job of morals. Here's an example. This is from another Nobel Prize winner. Ken Arrow, of course, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, James Buchanan did as well. He describes purchasing fruit from his uh, friend at uh, the fruit stand. Well, not his friend, I guess. I don't know the fruit salesman personally. I have no particular interest in his well-being. He reciprocates this attitude. I do not know, and I have no need to know, whether he's in the direst poverty, extremely wealthy, or somewhere in between. Yet the two of us are able to transact exchanges efficiently because both parties agree on the property rights relevant to them. So here's that idea coming back. It doesn't matter that I have no concern for him. What matters is that we agree on the property rights. Now, of course, what Ken Arrow 
showed, and what James Buchanan did not stress, is that in most situations, we don't actually have a system of property rights that works exactly that way. And so, the invisible hand needs a helping hand. Um, 20th and 21st century economists have recognized this. Uh, and we understand that many of our interactions take the form of the prisoner's dilemma that I've been talking about for the past two, two days, in which the self-interest of each is to the detriment of all. Uh, or public goods games, which are just an end person prisoner's dilemma. Now, these are called market failures, and in these situations, Adam Smith's uh, solution, competition for profits, is not sufficient because doing well and doing good are not the same thing. And there are lots of examples of this. These are well known. They're well known in economics. And uh, by the way, no restress here. This is absolutely uncontroversial. We have things like environmental pollution in which I take some action uh, as a producer or even as a consumer, which has effects on others. Uh, financial instability is another. An action I take may uh, have effects in other, in other parts of the market. Uh, product safety. In other words, the pursuit of profits has been shown in many, many areas. There's, uh, it's, it's really quite endless. I could, the list could have gone on. Uh, working conditions and so on. All of these are cases in which, for reasons that are pretty well known and pretty well studied, the invisible hand uh, doesn't work. Uh, and so the idea is that um, the helping hand can be provided uh, by things like green taxes subsidies for training workers, fines for faulty products. Now, the question is, well, are these sufficient? In other words, invisible hand plus helping hand, does that work? Is that good enough? Well, let's go back to Ken Arrow. He won the Nobel Prize for showing how the invisible hand will work. He spent the uh, time after that showing that the conditions under which it would work were very rarefied, and indeed, there were many, many uh, situations, in fact, it's the norm, according to Arrow, that his, the axioms of his famous hand break down. Uh, here's what he said. In the absence of trust, opportunities for mutually beneficial cooperation would have to be foregone. Norms of social behavior, including ethical and moral codes, may be reactions of society to compensate for market failures. Hmm, that's getting interesting. He's getting preferences back in, and he's saying, well, no, maybe Maybe the idea that of Mandeville's and Smith's, that we can do without the benevolence of the butcher, and we can just trust that the worst of all the multitude will do something for the common good, we have to, when we have market failures, perhaps worry about these things. Perhaps the helping hand proposed by economists is insufficient to save the invisible hand. What I want to propose to you today, and I'll give you evidence for it, that I believe is incontrovertible, that is, what if trust and social norms are undermined by the incentives? What happens if the incentives that economists devise to solve the market failures actually have a deleterious effect on people's willingness to engage for moral or ethical reasoning? Now, what I call Machiavelli's mistake is the separability assumption. Now, this is one of these points in, in working on this lecture. Separability is a mathematical concept. And many of you here know what it's about. Uh, and um, uh, mathematics is like sex. It's very important, and it's even fun, but you shouldn't do it in public. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you a verbal rendition of what we mean by separability. And I think those of you who are mathematicians or mathematically inclined will certainly understand. And I'm sure you're happy that I'm, I won't be doing that in public. Now, the classical writers, like Hume and Smith and others, they didn't imagine that citizens are amoral or that preferences can't change or won't be affected. Quite the opposite. Uh, David Hume was a pioneer in studying the evolution of morals, what he called moral conventions. And Adam Smith's other great book was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. They understood very well that societies are run on the basis of incentives and morality, not just incentives. But they did make this one mistake. They assumed that the moral sentiments and the material interests could be pursued separately in a very particular sense, that policies which are designed to shape behavior according to the material interest, that is, incentives, wouldn't compromise the former, that is, the moral sentiments. 
In that sense, these two things, values and incentives, are separable. You can use the word additive if you want. That's close enough. Having more of this doesn't alter the effectiveness of that. That's what separability means. I've gotten as close to mathematics as I'm going to go. Um, now, these propositions, the separability assumption, the fact that values and incentives are additive, uh, has formed the foundation of modern economic theories, from what's called mechanism design, that's the helping hand guys, implementation theory, what's called welfare economics, designing ways of correcting market failures, but it extends to things like optimal deterrence, judicial sentencing, uh, how to keep kids in school longer, and so on. Uh, and because of th these are the most recent Nobel Prize winners in economics, uh, we have um, Leo Hurwicz, uh, who unfortunately just passed away, uh, Meyerson and um, um, Eric Maskin here is on our science board at the Santa Fe Institute. We're very happy that he's part of the uh, Institute's uh, family. These are brilliant contributors to trying to, as I say, devise ways of getting around market failures by designing clever systems of incentives. Now, as before, uh, we have to define a few words here. Uh, when the material interest and the moral sentiments are not separable, there are two ways that they can be not separable. One is they can be complements. That means they're synergistic. That means that, in this case, explicit incentives will somehow empower the moral sentiments, make them more salient, make them more relevant, more effective in affecting behavior. Uh, this would be the case, for example, in um, traffic regulations. Most people obey traffic regulations out of reasons that they ought to do so. But if you lived in a society, for example, in Rome, Italy, where I spend a lot of time, uh, in which it doesn't seem to matter. I mean, you can park on the sidewalk, and you know, you're looking for a parking place, and you notice everybody's parking on the sidewalk, and there's a place on the sidewalk. Uh, now, and of course, there's no parking. Uh, now, so you're kind of tempted to do that because um, there, apparently the regulation isn't being followed. So, in other words, very, but in Tuscany, where I teach, uh, it's absolutely the opposite. Uh, there's almost no enforcement. But if anybody parked on the sidewalk, their car would be booted or towed immediately. Uh, and so, and that's, so notice the argument here. People are obeying the law in Siena, Florence, and so on because they want to. They think it's a decent thing to do. And nobody is actually exploiting their good citizenship by parking on the, uh, on the sidewalk. That's crowding in. That's these two things as complements. But they can be substitutes also. There can be a negative synergy between the two. Crowding out is what it is called. And this was famously uh, debated for a long time about blood donations. Uh, Titmus wrote a book a long time ago about the, uh, the fact that if you pay for blood, uh, it may actually reduce uh, the uh, amount of contributions of blood. Uh, interestingly, this, that idea of, the, of essentially non-separability, that is, these, these, uh, th this is a negative synergy between the two, was immediately noticed by some great economists, two Nobel Prize winners, Kenneth Arrow, one of them, and Robert Solow, wrote a review of this book. And they said, quite rightly, it's an interesting idea, but there, there's no empirical evidence. That was 20 years ago. Um, now, the question for us today is, is it possible for prices to do the work of morals? Does there exist, or could there exist, a set of policies, laws, property rights, and so on, such that entirely self-regarding citizens facing a social dilemma, like a public goods problem, common property resource, prisoner's dilemma, the kind of environmental problems we have, problems of neighborhood amenities and security and so on, uh, if facing those problems, uh, is there a way of handling these that, so that you can motivate people to act in a socially desirable way? Socially desirable ways means making sure you take account of the effect of your actions on others. Or on the contrary, must those who are concerned about such things as global warming, epidemic spread, uh, erosion of social norms, and other market failures, must we also be concerned about the preferences that citizens have? And the possibility that economic incentives may actually reduce, uh, reduce ethical behavior and not uh, 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 implement the outcomes that we wish. Um, and finally, if, if the material interest and the moral sentiments are indeed non-separable, uh, what are the implications for the use of explicit incentives? Should we use them more, less? How can you, we, we can't give up the use of incentives, they're absolutely essential in any social, social order, but what can we learn from this? Now we come to this experiment. Uh, 
Of course, you, the, you, this is, it's easy to figure out what happened, right? Uh, because why would I be putting this before you? Uh, uh, that's what happened. Uh, here we have the, the experiment begins here. The, the fine is announced. This is the control group here. Uh, they obviously didn't change. But the people who were given the fine, they doubled the amount of lateness. They came twi they, twice as many parents are coming late up here. And an interesting aspect here on week 17, when they stopped this thing, for <laughs> quite obvious reasons, I guess, they continued coming late. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, uh, okay, just so, I mean, you can practice using the language. In this case, the incentive and the moral commitment of the parents to come on time if they could seems to have been some kind of negative synergy. It looks here like the incentive, the fine, crowded out some pre-existing obligation that the parents were feeling. I mean, my interpretation is pretty obvious. Parents, who probably knew the teachers personally a bit, they felt badly when they were late, you know, but they got stuck in traffic or they ran an extra errand or something happened and they felt, you know, uh, and then the fine is imposed and they said, hot damn, they're putting a price there, I can buy lateness. Just, you know, it's, it's like a shirt. You know, and it was worth it. Uh, so, uh, not surprisingly, the authors of this paper, uh, the, the, the title of this paper is called A Fine is a Price, right? It's telling you that you can buy this thing. And notice, when some, somebody tells you you can buy this thing, for some reason, which we're gonna have to investigate, people think that means that it's a different kind of interaction and different rules apply. Um, now, uh, I want to turn to uh, another uh, slightly more complicated experiment, but it's an extremely relevant one. Juan Camilo Cardenas is an international fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. He's from uh, Uni University de los Andes in Bogota. Uh, and he has, for the past 10 or 15 years, designed ingenious experiments, not in the lab, not with students, but going to rural parts of Colombia. Right, you know what's going on in Colombia? So that's a somewhat dangerous thing to do, but he's so far, I mean, seriously, there's a civil war happening, or was happening during this period. He goes to rural areas, and he finds a place, he's interested in environmental sustainability. He finds a place uh, in which people are actually engaging in withdrawing resources from the forest, and uh, in almost all cases, uh, 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 over withdrawing, uh, so trashing the forest. And uh, so these are rural people, he, play, he does experiments with them. These are, it's a public goods game, basically, uh, uh, but it's kind of, it's, an, it's a variant on that. I guess I, I should explain it to you. It's kind of interesting how he does it. Um, the, um, there's a bowl, and instead of putting stuff into the bowl, which is how you do it in the public goods game, the bowl starts out with 50 little nuts or things in it. And s suppose you have five people in the group. You pass the bowl around to each of the five people, and you can take out as many as you like, up to 10. When the bowl's gotten all turned around, the experimenter doubles whatever's left in the bowl and then distributes that equally to everybody. So that's just like the, inver the inverted public goods game. Uh, you're all such good game theorists by now, you can easily figure out that the dominant strategy, remember what that is? That's the thing that you, sh you, you do better doing that no matter what everybody else does. The dominant strategy is to take out 10. You'll do better. Of course, you would like nobody else to take out anything, uh, and that, that'll maximize what you get, but it's true for everybody. So the dominant strategy is take out 10. Uh, so now the question is, uh, what do people do when they actually play this game? Uh, uh, by the way, it's, it's, it's a nice design. First, it doesn't re rely on people being literate. You can also, the chairs can be pointing in, so you can pass it around, people can see what's going on. You can have the chairs pointing out, so then they don't see. There are all kinds of variants here. Uh, so I direct your attention to this graph here. That's, we're going to start with that. Uh, the, um, uh, the vertical axis is not how many they took out. It's how much they deviated from what they would have taken out if they were totally selfish. So that mean, that's totally selfish. You don't deviate at all. You just do the selfish thing. Take them all. Up here, uh, that deviation would be if everybody had deviated six units, whatever they were. It was called months in the forest. But if they deviated that much, that would have been the social optimum. But notice, to do this much, you'd have to sacrifice a lot of self-interest. Uh, and these two groups, which in the first part of the game were identical in terms of the treatment, 
they were about halfway in between. That is, they deviated a lot from what would have been the selfish thing, but they didn't, they didn't uh, uh, restrain themselves as much as they, should, as they should have for the social optimum. Uh, and now the red dots are a group which in this treatment here is allowed to talk to each other. So after each time they play this game, this is period one, period two, period three, period four, at this point here they stopped and said, okay, we changed the rules now. Now after each time you play, you can have a conversation. It was timed, I think it was five minutes. Uh, it was also, uh, it was taped. A lot of it was videoed, which is incredible. They were very fantastic watching this. So you could talk. That's the, the red group is the group that got to talk. This dark group instead had a fine imposed on them. That is the experimenter himself, Juan Camilo, said, uh, if you take out the wrong amount, if you, you have to deviate that much or you'll get fined. And in the first round, they all did. Uh, then, as the game went on, they realized that the fine wasn't all that large, they weren't that likely to be monitored and so on, and they ended up down here essentially being entirely selfish. Now notice, these are the same people. The same people who here actually gave up a lot of money in order to do the right thing. Once they had the fine, once they learned about it, they did the exactly selfish thing. Uh, uh, now, what's your interpretation? By the way, here's just saying how much money they lost. Uh, that, that is, the, these guys here, this, this is exactly this graph here expressed in monetary units. Uh, now, how do you interpret that? Well, it sounds a little like the Haifa case, doesn't it? That somehow they were, they were doing okay. They were somehow constraining themselves ethically to not exploit their fellow group members. Uh, and uh, then they did a little better when they communicated. Uh, but the ones who had the fine started off doing the right thing, and they declined radically. Um, now, the... Um, I think the interpretation of that is that once the fine was imposed, it, it defined it as a different kind of interaction. Uh, actually, Juan Camila was very interested in the following problem. Why do people respond differently to regulations which come from the government than they do to regulations that come from the community? That's what he, that, that was his main intent in finding out this. Um, now, fines are... Economists think of fines as as prices, as uh, incentives. But interestingly, psychologists and sociologists think, and, and most human beings, think about a fine also as a signal. It tells you something about your behavior and the way that it's seen in the eyes of others. Um, now, this is a game, uh, this is done with uh, 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 Swiss students, again by Ernst Fair. You see the name Ernst Fair coming up uh, a lot here. Um, we have a person called the investor. Technically, in game theory, that's called a principal. And he transfers a sum to a trustee who is an agent. The sum of money is given to the investor by the experimenter and said, you can transfer some money. This amount is then doubled by the experimenter. And then the trustee can give some of that back to the investor. Uh, so it's an it's a interaction in which the investor has to trust that the other guy will send it back. Um, and then there are a number of treatments uh, here. Um, the uh, first, this is, just the, this is the so-called trust condition. There is no fine available. And uh, that's these bars here. And what is this telling us? Well, if I transfer between two and four units to you, you're going to transfer some back to me. But if I transferred eight to ten units to you, you transfer a lot more back. That shows that people are reciprocal. Uh, um, now, already, it's incredible what's happening here because, again, putting on your game theory hats and imagining, even worse, that you're economists, um, you, you know how this game should be played. Everybody should have offered zero, right? Because by backward induction, you understand that the person's not going to give you back anything, therefore, why give him anything? Uh, so if you really believed the other guy was selfish, you wouldn't have given anything. Uh, now, notice... Uh, the, um, uh, actually, the reason why we have no observations here is not because they didn't give any back. It's because there weren't any. That is, everybody gave something. Uh, now, um, the, um, then they had this, um, in, uh, this fine in which 
I, I'm the investor, and I say, okay, I'm going to um, transfer this amount to you. Say, I'm going to transfer 10. And if you don't give me back some amount which I specify, I'm going to fine you. Now, the interesting thing that is if you impose the fine, it's much worse. These are these black bars. That is, the fine actually makes people reciprocate less. Well, I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? The thing which is going on here is reciprocation. And you reciprocate a kind act. You reciprocate because of your belief about the intentions of the person who has offered you this. If the person offers you something and says, and if you don't give me back a lot, I'm going to fine you, that makes you wonder, or maybe not even wonder, about that individual's intentions. Now, notice the best thing of all. Here, you also had the option, if offered the fine, you could say, the fine is there, I'm not going to use it. You could renounce the fine. So I'm giving you 10, and there will be no fine. Though the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the trustee knows that I could have given a fine. That's terrific, the white bars. Having a fine and not using it. Now, I think I'm probably on the verge of convincing you that intentions really matter. That is, what's going on here is using the fine or not using the fine is signaling to the other guy about whether I trust you, whether I'm a kind person, whether I'm self-interested. We don't know exactly the content of it, but I'll come back to this experiment because there are a few more secrets that you can actually tease out of this, but I'll do that at the end. Uh, now, uh, this is a more complicated uh, experiment but it's worth, it's worth understanding it. Basically, uh, you could consider this to be on-the-job learning. Up until now, I've argued that there's a kind of a framing or a kind of a cueing which is going on, or perhaps it's signaling about an intention. But I think what's going on in this experiment here is actual learning. That is, I think that people, when exposed to incentives, actually end up having different preferences. That is, they come to have different evaluations of what they ought to do. So let me walk, walk you through this. Uh, uh, in this case here, this is a public goods game. That's the social optimum. The, the experimenters, again, notice again, including FAIR, they designed an incentive so that the selfish thing to do was to give 30. And this, these are periods in the game. And sure enough, the incentive worked exactly. That is, people implemented what the incentive said. Now, it's interesting that unlike the Colombians, uh, they just did exactly right away what the incentive said. Then here, they took away the incentive, and so the selfish outcome became this number here. And notice, individuals gradually declined to becoming selfish, but only over a period of maybe 20 periods. Uh, so at first, they, uh, um, uh, uh, they gave a lot, but it declined. Well, then a very interesting question is, uh, what would happen if they had the no incentive treatment first. That's here. Now notice this line here is a lot higher than that line there. It's actually 26% higher and it's extremely statistically significant. So without having experienced the incentives in the first place, they were willing to give more. This behavior is very common in every public goods game, but notice this is, they're just giving more. Uh, and then when you institute the incentive, they go right back to doing the selfish thing. So in other words, I think there's something a little new here. Experiencing incentives may make us a different kind of person in terms of how we evaluate our, the pros and cons. Um, and uh, th this is the basic idea. The deviation from the selfish thing uh, is larger if they've not previously experienced the incentive. Now, of course, once again, I mean, th there's, a, there's a little parenthesis, or it's not a footnote because it's too important, but I, th I think this is worth thinking about. We live in societies in which incentives are highly stressed. Uh, and if you think of the human developmental process as one that goes on over periods of time, you can imagine if this is learning on the job and this takes place in the course of a few hours in the lab, imagine the effect that it might have living in a society in which we are experiencing the kind of uh, incentives all the time. Um, this is another uh, experiment which I think shows the same thing. That is, we actually change as a result of this. This is a trust game exactly like the one I said before. You give some, they give back, or they may, maybe they don't give back. Uh, if, you, um, if you look at the top here, I'm sorry, the, the, 
I tried to put maybe too much on the page. Here, if you give this much, they give back that much. And you can see, you see the same reciprocity as before. If you give a lot, they give a lot back. Uh, and uh, this is the first round of the, uh, the, the first phase of the game. Here's the last phase of the game. There's a missing phase in between that I'm not showing you. I'm going to tell you what it was. Uh, here, the intervening stage, this is the first round. These are all the same. And they look the same. There's reciprocity. Here, that's just repeating the same thing as that. What they did here was they did the fine experiment. They just imposed a fine. That is, I could impose a fine on you if you didn't give it back. And following that, you got a much less reciprocal response than you had there. Their interpretation of this is, once again, that people actually learn. That is, they become less reciprocal if they experience a fine. So even after the fine is gone, they're kind of wrecked you know, uh, by the experience. Um, now, it also works a little bit here. That's a reward. And that's interesting, and we should take that into account. Fines may have, may have a larger crowding out effect than rewards. And why is that? Well, probably one of the things that fines is bad about fines is it fines trashes reciprocity because it signals bad intent, whereas the reward doesn't. So it isn't just that you're getting money for it. It may be it's the fact that you're being incentivized means something bad about the other guy. Keep that in mind as we try to understand these things. OK. Um, why does separability fail? Um, I have to confess, I don't know. Uh, I, I am in print uh, as having provided four reasons. Uh, I would not want my life to depend on being able to identify which reason was going on in the Haifa experiment and which reason was going on in the trust experiment. I think these reasons are suggestive. I would appreciate any comments and help. This is the next stage. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of experiments now, and piecing it together with some interpretation is obviously step number, uh, number two, and step number three is then using that knowledge. Um, uh, as is often the case, uh, I accept the fact that research is an ongoing process, and as I say, I've been working on this for 20 years, or I should say I started this 20 years ago. The first thing that incentives do is that they frame what type of problem is this. Uh, people are good at accepting cues. Kids who swear in the street don't swear in school. Uh, everybody knows you can basically cue your behavior on certain things, and incentives say it's all right to be selfish in this situation. Maximizing is okay. Uh, the, um, now, uh, by the way, you probably remember that if you play the Prisoner's Dilemma game, and it's named the community game, People cooperate like crazy, despite the fact that they shouldn't be. And if you call it the Wall Street game, they defect. So that's framing. That's just, uh, you know, it says, that's the nature of the experiment. What are we doing here? Uh, now, a more uh, slightly demanding argument is this. Remember I talked about the investor as the principal and the trustee as the agent. Uh, in principal agent problems in economics, of which there are many, banker, borrower, the banker is the principal, the borrower is the agent, uh, employer, worker. The employer is the principal, the agent is the worker. In all those situations, you're devising incentives to try to get the agent, if you're the principal, to try to get the agent to do something which he or she otherwise wouldn't do without the incentives. Uh, so um, how do you solve this problem? Well, it's a two-step process. Mathematically, what you do is you first figure out the behavioral responses of the other person, and you formulate that as a mathematical function. Given that function, you then say, Given that behavioral regularity, what's the best I can do? What's the best incentive I can do? And then you impose the incentive and the person responds. Well, notice this. If I impose an incentive on you, I necessarily have to reveal something about what I thought about you because the incentive was in response to my supposition about your behavioral responses. Uh, so um, uh, the, the trustee who, f who threatens to fine you is saying, I don't trust you. The employer who says, I'm going to pay you a decent wage, but I'm going to monitor you with a TV camera and watch your every move, says, I don't trust you, uh, and so on. You can think of all the cases in which this happens. So you can convey an intent. Uh, now, it's not just that I, you may convey the intent of what you think about the, the worker or the trustee, lazy, unreliable, unreciprocating. Uh, you may convey something about yourself. For example, that you're greedy, 
uh, or that you're trying to get most of the gains from this experiment for yourself. I'll come back to that. I think it's important. A, a proposal coming from psychology, uh, actually quite an old theory, uh, has to do with self-determination. Uh, a, a group of psychologists, Nisbet, Leffer, Desi, and others, uh, proposed that people have an uh, intrinsic desire for self-determination. You could see how natural selection might have actually encouraged that, uh, but in any case, observationally, it's probably quite true. Uh, if, uh, if you provide an incentive for something which you would like to do anyway, it's called over-justification, technically. That's what the term is in psychology. And what it means is I, I'm providing another reason for something I would have done anyway. The classic experiments on this, they started off with kids and paintings. Uh, you have a group of kids and they come into a, uh, there two there's two groups. Uh, in one treatment, the kids come into a room, there's a lot of stuff they can do to play with, including there's some paints. And some of them paint pictures. And the same thing's going on in the other room. The only difference is, in one room, when the kid comes back with a painting, uh, the teacher says, why, Mary, that's a beautiful painting. It's, uh, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much. But in the other room, she says, Mary, that's a beautiful painting. It's really wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll pay you a dollar for that. OK? And then the next day, the kids come back. And they go to the room, and they observe what the kids do. Guess what? The kids who got paid for painting don't paint. Uh, statistically significantly less amount of painting of the kids who got paid for doing it. What's that about? Uh, well, the kids presumably, according to the self-determination theory, say, say, well, I like that, but I'm, I, I enjoyed the fact of doing this by itself, but somehow being paid for it reduces the incentive of me for me to do it. By the way, self-determination theory, or this so-called motivational crowding out, doesn't apply to things that you wouldn't want to do. We know there's lots of good empirical economic research that incentives work to get people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. So we're here talking about, not about the fact that incentives necessarily backfire, but when there is something to crowd out, like the fact that the kids actually enjoyed painting, or the fact that the parents really wanted to be on time but they just couldn't be, if there's something to crowd out, you have to worry. The fourth thing is, oh, I, this is kind of a mouthful, sorry about that. Endogenous preferences. Well, you know what preferences are. An endogenous just means that they're being generated by the problem at hand. Um, I, uh, I, I teach my students a lot about, I, I think one of the main problems in social theory, economic theory, is to distinguish between what's endogenous, that is generated by the variables under study, and what's exogenous, that is, which you take as given. And I had a teaching assistant at Harvard who reported the following to me in a review for uh, one of the hour exams. He said that he was um, asked if there are any questions, and uh, one of the students said, could you explain again the difference between erogenous and indigenous? <laughs> uh, uh, well, this, um, this endogenous preference is, I think you've seen it in a couple of experiments, uh, that the exposure to the incentives leads people to act differently even after the incentives are gone. Now, I don't think experiments are a good way to study endogenous preferences. I think we should look and see whether people who live in societies which have a certain incentive structure actually behave differently from people who live in other kinds of societies. Uh, the research which I mentioned before on the 15 small-scale societies where we did experiments around the, the world, that was a classic case of being able to study how if you're a whale hunter, you probably have different kinds of preferences than if you're a slash and burn agriculturalist. And sure enough, that's what we found. So we're pretty sure that preferences are shaped by the process of making a living. Uh, and what we see in these experiments, which is quite remarkable because they take a couple of hours, whereas your preferences develop over a lifetime, uh, but we see it anyway, that people seem to be changing their preferences. The examples that I gave about traffic in Rome it, uh, may be what you would call exploitation aversion. Uh, and that's crowding in, by the way. That's a situation in which I'm willing to cooperate as long as I'm pretty sure the other guys aren't going to uh, exploit me by defecting. Uh, and I think there are lots and lots of examples in this, and there's, a, there's some very nice experimental research. I mentioned the work uh, by Toshio Yamagishi uh, about uh, ethnic and um, uh, group differences. He's also done some fabulous research on, on this, showing that being assured that the other members of the group would be punished by the experimenter means that I'm perfectly willing to cooperate because I know that if they defect, though it'll make me angry, at least somebody will punish them. So I won't be a complete sucker. 
Now, I surveyed these, these, these uh, reasons in a recent paper in Science, and um, just uh, in case you hadn't already figured this out, the fact that it's published in Science doesn't mean that it's true. I've already told you that these are just a list of things. This is the best I could do. How, actually, the editors of Science did push me a little further, and they said, well, what do these things have in common? And <laughs> I, re I responded, look, Maybe they don't have anything in common. In fact, I don't even know if that's exactly what's going on. The, the, these experiments were not designed to piece apart what was going on. These experiments were designed for other purposes. So he, he pushed me, and I, I think there is a unifying thread. Economists treat economic activity as being about getting stuff and having it. Human beings treat economic activity both as getting and having, but also as becoming and being. That is, we engage in activities so that we can be a certain kind of person, in our own eyes and in the eyes of others. That's the constitutive aspect of social action. It doesn't have to do with acquiring things. It just has to do with acquiring a self. So that technically what we say in economics, if somebody's producing two things at once, we call it joint production. Any production is joint production because you're producing a good or a service and you're producing yourself in that activity. The production of yourself is what's being compromised by some of these incentives. And I think we can see it in all of these cases uh, that there is this constitutive aspect of, um, that's being uh, compromised. Now, I said we'd come back to these trustee guys and you recognize this as the public goods game from before. Um, now, I want to pose a question to you. I think I might know the answer, but I, I have to say I was kind of shocked when I realized that um, there's a kind of discrepancy. This is a public goods game. These are the periods of the public goods game. And they play the public goods game at first without any possibility of punishment. So remember, that's just end person prisoner's dilemma. The people could be contributing zero, they could be contributing 20, and here they contribute about 11. That's a bit like the Colombian rural people who are halfway between doing the right thing and doing the totally selfish thing. And um, here, they have punishment. Sorry. Here, if you contribute too little, uh, other people can punish you. Do you remember how that worked? At the end of each round, you see on your screen how much everybody contributed in your group, and then you can pay money to reduce their payoffs. So this punishment here that these guys are doing uh, is what's sustaining that co contribution level, presumably because people are worried about the possibility of getting punished. If you take away the punishment, it goes down to zero. And that is, as I said, this is a typical pattern in a public goods game. Uh, they just withdraw. Uh, now, uh, this, by the way, this is not the same graph you saw two nights ago. Uh, this is the last time I showed what happens if you do no punishment first and then punishment. But obviously, in all these experiments, we do it in both directions because we want to make sure that there's no effect of which one comes first. And you'll see this, this is almost exactly the same as when you do it inverted. Uh, so here, you have punishment by peers, and it sustains a high level of contribution. But here, when the guy threatens to punish somebody who doesn't give enough back, it destroys the reciprocity. So, I mean, isn't there a little puzzle there? Why does punishment in the public goods game work? And why does punishment here fail? Why does it backfire? Um, well, you already know something about this punishment activity that's sustaining this, uh, these cooperation. Uh, if I'm in a group, a in a public goods game, we know that if I contribute to the group, that's altruistic as I defined it yesterday, meaning I would receive higher payoffs if I didn't do it. Then I see on the screen that Alan didn't contribute. And so then I'm going to punish him by paying a buck to, so, so as to take a buck out of his pocket. And guess what? That's also altruistic, right? The punishment is just as altruistic as the contribution. So when Alan is punished by me, he can't possibly think that I have selfish intent in having punished him because he knows that I gave up a buck in order to do that with no prospect of gain. By the way, in some of these games, they shuffle the membership of the groups every period so that you can't possibly gain by punishing anybody. People punish anyway. They love to punish. Uh, <laughs> now, so I think that this works because punishment is altruistic. You're not conveying any bad intent. You're conveying good intent. And Alan feels actually a little badly about that because not only 
does he lose some payoffs. But he's heard from a member of his group, a peer, not somebody up high, but a peer, who's saying, we don't like what you did. Uh, now, down here in the trust game, we have a different story. The negative effect of the incentives, the fact that this black bar is low when you use the incentives, it's almost entirely due to the fact that among some of these investors, when they, when they imposed the fine, they, they asked for a number to be returned such that if the person actually returned it, they would get almost all of the profits and the uh, trustee would get nothing. Some of the investors who proposed a fine did quite the opposite. What they did is they figured out, it's not you know, rocket science, you can figure out what the guy would have to give back to you so that you walk away with the same sum. In other words, even, divide the pie evenly. And when you divide the pie evenly, you don't have this negative response, or at least you have a very small negative response, 8%, and this was not statistically significant. So now we're making some progress, because here you can see that the reason for this crowding out was because it wasn't just that it was a fine. It was a fine with greedy intent, and that's why it had the negative reaction, or at least that's what I think. Now, in economics, there's a very interesting theorem called the theorem of the second best due to Lipsy and Lancaster. And what they say is that if there are a bunch of problems in the economy and you can't fix them all, so suppose there are a bunch of market failures, and if you can't fix all of them, fixing one of them can make things worse. So a piecemeal approach, moving closer to the ideal of property rights and competitive exchange doesn't necessarily improve things. Well, I think we have a second best result here. Where contracts are incomplete, that is, you you, not everything that's being exchanged is subject to property rights. And hence, where norms may be important in attenuating market failures, as Kenneth Arrow said, public policies and legal practices which more closely approximate the idealized complete contracting situation, that is, incentives, fines, and so on, they may exacerbate the underlying market failure because they may undermine socially valuable norms such as trust and reciprocity and may result in a less efficient equilibrium allocation. In other words, what an economist would say is improving incentives need not improve the result uh, because of this uh, crowding out thing along with Arrow's insight. Now, that's why I think Machiavelli is mistaken. Um, if the error that I've just uh, exposed to you, my second best theorem about how perfecting incentives may make things worse, if that's a problem today, it's going to be a much bigger problem tomorrow. And the reason is this. Um, I call the economy which we have now left behind the economy of grain and steel. It's the economy in which a very small minority of Americans engage, compared to the service economy in which we don't produce anything you can hold in your hand or weigh and measure. Uh, that's called the weightless economy. It's what all of us here do, almost all of us, I suppose. Uh, we talk. We write, we exchange things, we project effects. Uh, the grain and steel economy was characterized by being able to own the things that it produced. It could be fenced, it could be weighed, it could be written down in a contract, and therefore it could be exchanged roughly according to the principles of the invisible hand. I don't want to exaggerate how well the invisible hand worked in the economy of grain and steel, but uh, it contrasts sharply with the kinds of non-contractual activities in which, which are the core and the heart of the information-based economy. Um, these are the people you order your um, J. Crew shirts from. Uh, they have American accents and they have an American flag there. Uh, this one is named Suman and this is Sushila. Uh, they're in Bangalore. Uh, and, uh, they are doing what a lot of people do. They're talking, they're buying, they're selling. Uh, they're teaching, they're taking care of the sick. Uh, they're serving food in restaurants. They're doing all of those things which we simply cannot write down the contract about what they're supposed to do because the thing that they're doing cannot be fenced or weighed or measured. You cannot, I mean, you cannot really measure what they're doing. Now, why is that important? Well, obviously, it opens up a huge area of the economy in which market failures exist and in which Ken Arrow told us that we should be relying on trust and similar ethical reasoning to overcome the market failures. Now, 
In the weightless economy, copying costs are roughly zero. Uh, that means copying programs, copying music, copying ideas, uh, copying uh, um, virtually anything which is primarily informational in content. Now, that means two things. It means that ownership of goods is difficult. It's very difficult to maintain the ownership because it's easily stolen. Uh, and copied, that, that means, Ill illegitimately. But I want to mention something else, which is uh, even assuming you could enforce, enforce ownership of intellectual property rights, it wouldn't be a good thing because a good which can be made available at a zero cost should be available at a zero cost. Fundamental principle of economics is that the prices which implement the efficient outcome in the invisible hand theorem is exactly this. The price should be equal to the marginal cost. That's the mantra. Every economist knows that. Well, if the cost of an additional unit made available, namely copied, another copy of Windows, another copy of a song, or whatever, if the cost of that is zero, the invisible hand theorem says its price should be zero. But if its price is zero, how is it going to get produced? Uh, we do have a problem here because the invisible hand logic fails not a little bit. It fails spectacularly when we get to the weightless economy. Now, successful implementation of property rights is not a good idea. Well, we, ne we know that the world is more interconnected. Uh, we are connected with other parts of the world, but this process has been going on, of course, since the 19th century. The, um, it's a commonplace to say that. But there is some news, and that's this. What now connects us around the world uh, is, not, is no longer just the contracts which used to organize the exchange of grain and steel. That used to be, if you look at the world and how it was connected, that's how the world was connected primarily, but today it's not. The sinews of this newly connected world today include also climatic effects, epidemic spread, songs, computer applications, affect like hatred, love, information, all things which cannot be fenced or weighed or written down in contracts. They're important. We do them. We have these effects. In many cases, we make our living doing them. Uh, they, these are the things which are going to determine if we and other members of this uh, humankind have a decent life, and they cannot be subject to contract. So we're looking at a massive arena of the areas where Kenneth Arrow advised us to pay attention to trust. The invisible hand applies to none of these. Prices in these areas will never do the work of morals because of the kinds of dilemmas I just said. But even the helping hand mechanism is likely to fail, given that governments do not have, and I would say should not have, the information and the power to intervene in the ways which would induce us to act as self-interested people in such a way that we would treat these things in a way which would be socially desirable. Uh, when I said the, they don't have the information, they would have to have information which would be unavailable. Uh, it's unavailable except to people who are very close to us and provide the information freely. How would a government extract the information of how, about, how much something was worth to me or worth to you when it couldn't be priced in a market? I can't imagine it, and I would hate to live in such a society in which a government had those powers. Uh, but in any case, they don't, and they never will. So that adding the helping hand to the invisible hand will help, but it won't be enough. Um, now, I was told I shouldn't end on a bad note, uh, so I want to come back to cooperation. I mean, remember, the good news is that we don't necessarily have to organize our social life purely on the basis of self-interest. In some cases, cooperation based both on self-interest and on other regarding preferences works. And sometimes it works spectacularly. like in Wikipedia or open source. There are plenty of examples today. This is not something that one imagines might happen in the future. Much of what's going on in the information economy today actually is already in place. People are working in ways which are not basically based on the kinds of incentives you see in markets, with kinds of incentives that Kenneth Arrow approved could work under some circumstances in the invisible hand theorem. Utopian, you know I'm interested in hunter-gatherer society. The culture's big men and tribal elders are required to talk softly and humorously to deprecate themselves at every turn in order to maintain their status. It consciously distrusts and despises egotism and ego-based motivations. Self-promotion tends to be mercilessly criticized. Have I gone back to the Aceh 
who shared the meat and the honey? Am I talking about the Lamellera whale hunters who we talked about yesterday? Guess again. This is a description of the culture of the open source software production community as described in the book The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And I think you'll find similar kinds of motivations in lots of collective intellectual production projects, including, by the way, the research activities in which many of us engage. Now, I'm not proposing that we should organize our societies the way the hunters and gatherers organize our societies, but I am proposing that some of the problems we face are not so different from the ones that they face. They couldn't own the kudu either, or the giraffe, which they were seeking, and they figured out a way to chase it anyway and then share it when they caught one once in a while. Just the way uh, software writers uh, work as part of a team, uh, and they, they know it may be years before they actually come up with a really great app, uh, but uh, they have ways of getting themselves through that through whatever sharing methods they have. Now, back to the future. Yeah, exactly. We now have costless, virtually costless, decentralized transfer of inf information around thousands of participants, and this allows for mutual monitoring, reputation building, ostracism, and other methods which were common to foraging bands, but on a global scale. You know how this works. You know how the trust mechanisms work in, for example, if you look at things like Wikipedia and so on, and the editing and so on. These, of course, were never available to small-scale societies, but it's the same idea. You monitor, you ostracize, you ridicule, uh, and you get people to shape up because they want to be seen well in the eyes of their fellows. Okay, the conclusion is the constitution for knaves, in either its invisible hand or its helping hand version, is not going to provide a system in, of incentives which will promote adequately a flourishing and sustainable world today, a future, uh, given that we are in a weightless economy and a global village now connected by sinews of non-contractable exchanges which are essential to our well-being. The good news is that we're not knaves, at least not all of us all the time. Uh, social order, contrary to Hobbes and contrary to Mencken and the cynics, Contrary even to Alexis de Tocqueville's Americans, who he uh, ridiculed, uh, social order has never been uh, relied on solely, has, has never depended on self-interest to be maintained. Uh, social order would surely break down if indeed we were knaves. And the whole project of trying to design a society which would somehow work if we were all knaves seems to be actually quite preposterous. Um, our altruistic predispositions this legacy of 100,000 years of evolution does provide an essential resource. It's one which has to be recognized, mobilized, and empowered. Uh, now, that's crucial, because notice, I've shown you, I think, that incentives can actually demobilize and disempower those dispositions for altruistic behavior. What is empowered? Well, remember the public goods game with punishment. Suppose you have a public goods game with no punishment and you have two or three selfish people and six or seven unselfish people. And the selfish people don't contribute. And then what do the, what do the altruistic people do? Well, pretty soon they don't contribute either because they, they're getting angry at the people who are free riding on them. So a few selfish people can induce everybody to act as if they were selfish, even the ones who aren't selfish. But exactly the same thing is true in the other direction. When you add punishment to the public goods game, a few people who are civic-minded and willing to engage in altruistic punishment uh, can induce people who actually are selfish to act as if they were generous. Well, this is a really interesting problem then for constitution building. It's no longer that we have a group of people who are homogeneously this or that. We have a heterogeneous population of people who could go either way. And whether you're going to empower the civic-minded or whether you're going to empower the selfish ones is a choice. And we, we know something about how to do that. And so, as a coda, the basic problem of institutional design is not to find a way to induce a homogeneous population of self-regarding individuals to do the desirable thing. I presume to update Hume, a person who I greatly admired. I'm sure I could not improve on what he's written. But this is what I would now say in place of what he wrote. The task of the policymaker, the jurist, uh, the person designing incentives, including the employer, the banker, is to devise rules, incentives, uh, such that in cases where cooperation is socially desirable, other regarding preferences will be sustained. That is, you will not essentially obliterate them, crowd them out. 
Uh, and individuals with these other regarding preferences will have opportunities to express their pro-social predispositions in ways that induce all or most others to cooperate, as in the public goods game with punishment. So that's Hume rewritten. Now, that doesn't get us in a very comfortable place, because contra the philosophical foundations of philosophical liberalism, and in agreement with Aristotle, what this says is the policymaker, like the parent or the teacher, must be concerned with inculcating habits. The government cannot avoid being concerned about the preferences of the citizens. It is a liberal cop-out to say, oh, we say nothing about people's ends and their preferences. That's up to them. Now, by the way, I'm not advocating that the government should get in the business of changing people's preferences. I'm telling you, that's what governments do. What do you think schooling is about? It's about inculcating habits. What do, what do you think teaching nationalism is about? That has to do with changing people's preferences. But what I've shown now is in very subtle ways, designing any system of incentives is likely to affect the values and objectives that people have. There's no way of avoiding it. So the choice is not, should the government get into the business of being concerned about people's preferences? We know that already. They are. It's that should we talk about it? Should we talk about it as a democratic community? What kinds of preferences do we really think are better? Don't tell me, please, that you are unable to think about that. It's too hard. Those of you who are parents think about it all the time. Imagine being a parent and not being able to speak with conviction and with some knowledge about what it is you're trying to do with your kids. Or imagine those of you in the room, like me, a teacher. Don't you sometimes think that one of the things you're trying to do is to inculcate habits of, for example, loving science, being an honest scholar. And if you don't think that, I'm surprised. Uh, I think <laughs> that was very nice, wasn't it? I mean, I, that's all I'm going to say. It's just surprised. Uh, now, by the way, I know something about societies which have a dictatorial um, predisposition towards uh, organizing culture. Um, I think Jeff mentioned that I was a musician in the Soviet Union. Uh, for I did two concert tours there. Uh, I saw what happened to musicians who did things which were not allowed. It didn't happen to me, although the, the police did try in a number of occasions to close down the uh, concerts that I was doing. Uh, but they did things like, for example, not allowing the two jazz musicians in my group to play a jazz concert until a huge protest at the Leningrad Conservatory was done. I know a lot about the dangers of governments being involved in shaping values, firsthand. Uh, so I'm not saying this because I think it's easy. I'm saying it because I think it's inevitable. I think we're doing it and we should start talking about it. I want to thank my many co-authors and my many critics. Uh, again, here's the Santa Fe Institute. That's the University of Siena. Actually, right there is my office. Uh, and um, I, I want to thank the uh, Cowan Endowment at the Santa Fe Institute in particular, which has supported this massive, massive project involving literally dozens and dozens of people that have allowed me to stand before you to introduce you to these ideas. I hope you don't think that I invented them. Uh, this came out of a process of literally dozens of people talking over years, arguing, trying to get it straight, probably getting it wrong still some of the time. And here, in a shameless, non-altruistic step, I will tell you that some of this is in a book of mine called Microeconomics. Um, and uh, here are some other uh, papers that um, uh, you may find interesting. This is The Weightless Economy in Action. My American English language publisher, of course, insists that you pay money for this. But I managed to negotiate with every other publisher, the Spanish, uh, the Russian, and the Italian, and presumably some others as time goes on, free online editions. So uh, while it's crass for me to advertise this, I, I really suggest you really should read the Italian or Russian or Spanish <laughs> editions. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. We have a bit of time for questions and comments. I, I have appreciated very, very much the comments in the last two nights. And uh, don't feel the need to put a question mark at the end of your comment. Uh, just uh, let, me, let me hear what you think and where you think this should go and what's wrong with it. Uh, yes.
okay, when, uh, well, first, if, if you have a, a, a friend's uh, a piece of music, uh, you can put it on your iPod, right? Uh, now, that doesn't cost, okay, it costs you something, right? You know, it's a little bit of bother. Uh, but, or consider the music in the first place. A CD costs about 20 bucks uh, on the market. Uh, what does it cost to make another CD available? It's less than a buck. Uh, that is the cost of actually producing one more CD. What's the difference between the buck and the 20? Well, that's paying for the musician, that's paying for the advertising, it's paying, for the, it's, it's paying to get the stuff actually done in, uh, in the first place. So people who study information economics distinguish between the first copy cost, which is uh, a huge sum for uh, a CD, uh, and the marginal cost. The marginal cost is, I mean, that's, an, that's actually that's not unusual, that the, that, that the marginal cost may be 1 20th of the price. Now remember, what, what the economist tells you is the price should be equal to marginal cost. That means the price of a CD should be less than a buck, but it's $20. So, I mean, we don't have to quibble about whether it's really a buck or a zero. I mean, the point is, it's, you know, it's a, if it's a factor of 20 different. But can I just follow up? Sure, sure. I, I absolutely agree. The fact that the person has to eat, and, and so on, all those other things you said, doesn't alter the fact that having one more song on their iPod doesn't cost them much, if they have an iPod. If they don't have an iPod, they're out of the game. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, people obey property rights uh, because it's the law and they feel morally obliged to obey the law. And they feel that this is something they're willing to engage in, even when it inconveniences them, because over a very long period of time, studied by Hume and Smith and others, we've learned that respecting property rights is a good way to organize a society. So that this moral injunction to not violate property rights is backed up by this very powerful argument that organizing societies according to the respect of property rights is a good way to organize the production and distribution of whatever we need. Now, in the weightless economy, the last statements that I said are wrong. That is, we still have a moral obligation, one presumes, to respect the property rights, but the backup is gone. There is no backup anymore. Uh, the, the, the argument that you should respect property rights just Deontologically, that is as a commitment, fine. Uh, that's something which I think people rightly have. But the fact that you should respect property rights because that's a good way to organize society is just wrong uh, when it comes to the things I'm talking about. Now, much of the world, as the previous questioner probably has in mind, much of the world is not so worried about putting songs on their iPod. They're worried about putting shirts on their back and food on the table. And in those cases, that still is the economy of grain and steel. And it would be a terrible travesty for the economy of grain and steel if property rights were violated on a grand scale. We've already seen what happens when that, when that happens. So we really have a bind. We have an economy now which is going to be for the foreseeable future, mixed between one in which property rights work reasonably well, I don't mean to exaggerate how well, and one in which property rights work extremely badly. And by the way, I mentioned information, but I could have mentioned pharmaceuticals and I could have mentioned a whole bunch of other things in which the stories that you get about uh, you know, uh, uh, treatments which cost a dollar to make available being priced at 50 bucks or 20 bucks and therefore unable to be used in many parts of the world. It, you, know, you find the people from the pharmaceutical companies on TV, uh, uh, they look horrible. I mean, uh, they, they say, 
uh, well, look, uh, how are we going to get this stuff produced? And then there's this member of a South African NGO saying, yes, but do you understand that we could be curing these diseases and it only costs a dollar to make this thing available and you're charging us 50 bucks? And the guy looks sick, right? But, I mean, that's unfortunate for him, but he's saying something real. That is a real problem. You can't just say the price should be zero without saying, how are you going to get the stuff produced? Uh, now, we have a lot of very, very, in, very intuitive, uh, very uh, uh, interesting and uh, creative ideas about how you separate the production of the stuff from its invention. Uh, uh, that, that, I mean, that is a one word answer. You've got to separate the incentives, get, get, get the idea there, the first copy cost. You've got to separate that from producing the pills or whatever. Uh, how you do that is a big, that's a big, big research project going on right now. Um, yes? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, the, uh, I mean, obviously housing, I mean, it's, it's a combination of things. It's, the housing has boomed and wages have sagged. And uh, the combination of those things, if you, I mean, it's a very interesting calculation. Uh, how, many, uh, how many hours would you have to work at the average wage of an American production worker to purchase the average house sold in America? Uh, that has gone way up. Uh, and I mean that's I mean and and therefore you get uh, the problems you're talking about. Um, now, if you think that kids living with their family until they're 30 is a really good thing, uh, and we're, we're doing it right, that's what happens in Italy, by the way. I'm, but in Italy, it's called momism. Um, that is because the, the Italian guys really like to live with their moms. I think it's because they don't want to uh, do their dishes or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I, altruism uh, evolved in human society because of group competition and I believe could not have evolved any other way. Uh, a very, an, an important aspect, and, and the, how that works, I'm, I'm sure you recall, that basically the groups with a lot of altruists survive in a competitive process with groups which have fewer. And that is why they can win in the horse race against the fact that in every group the altruists are doing poorly compared to the non-altruists. Is war necessarily involved? Uh, someone uh, kindly asked me a question last night. Uh, couldn't we basically be non-parochial altruists? And I, I answered yes. Were it the case that the competition between groups was a kind of invisible competition in which a group over here and a group over here were struggling against the environment and the one with a lot of cooperators survives and these guys over here uh, die out and then these people come over and take their land but after they're already gone, you, that's a scenario that could work. Now, as I said, I think the evidence is overwhelming that humans did have a lot of warfare in their past. And I didn't bring it up to the present, but I, I could very easily. The last half millennium in Europe is a wonderful example. I mean, brutal example, but a, a perfect example of the kind of group selection whereby certain forms of government and certain forms of citizenry simply were eliminated. And what was the process? War. That was it. One word, war. The ones who won the war are the ones who survived. I mean, just one, one word about history. In Europe, there were something like 500 separate entities, sovereign bodies, in 1450. 500. Some of them were called bishoprics. Some of them were actually places ruled by pirates. Some were free cities in southern Germany. Some were the city-states of Europe. Some were kingdoms, small ones. Some were called empires, and so on. A huge variety organized on different terms. By the beginning of the First World War, there were 26 sovereign bodies left standing. And in this, in this great shakeout, which eliminated more than 450 of these states, a single form survived. That's what we call the modern nation state. In that modern nation state, they had done a few things that worked. They had established, in most of the cases, private property. They'd established a system of taxation which most people paid. They'd established a kind of nationalism whereby people were willing to go to war against others. In other words, they'd cultivated a certain kind of citizenry. 
and they survived because of war. Uh, now, does that mean that in the future we'll have to rely on war in order for this to continue? Absolutely not. For the very same reason that I said parochialism, racism, ethnicity, and so on may have been our legacy, but it's not our destiny. I feel exactly the same thing. We don't need warfare to promote altruism. In fact, of course, it's extraordinarily dangerous. Yes? Uh, Two-part question. Part. Do I gather from the manner in which you presented the evolution of altruism some hankering, some desire to not use special factors in the explanation of human evolution? Human altruism. No. Would you prefer it if you didn't have to involve culture, you didn't have to involve... No. I mean, I think... Uh, um, First, I, as I said at the end of my last talk, there is no evidence that any of this stuff is genetic, but it could be. Uh, but there isn't evidence for it. Why do I use such a simple model? Well, uh, here's the task I, I set out for myself. I observe that humans are unique among animals in the ways that we cooperate. So I'd better have an explanation that works for humans but doesn't work for all the other animals, or otherwise dogs should be doing it, right? Um, so that's the job, is to figure out a model that works for humans, but not for everybody else. And that means taking account of humans' specific abilities. Uh, so that means I'm building into this thing some stuff that humans do, but virtually nobody else does. Now, slime molds aren't doing it? Slime molds, no. They're, uh, they're, they, do, they do some of the coordination, uh, but they don't do it among non-relatives. Uh, and yeah, they don't. They're related. Uh, that's how slime molds, I mean, that's a funny you should mention, that's the paper that uh, Steve Frank uh, wrote, uh, which I quoted yesterday. Uh, so there are all kinds of things that are unique to humans, which explain why we have this unique trajectory. So I, I mean, I not only am resisting, you know, your suggestion that I'm resisting building in special things, yes, I want to build in special things, because I don't want this to work for every other animal. Uh, now, how many special things do I build in? Well, you've got me on that. I mean, you know, as few as possible. Uh, and uh, it may be that some of the things that, um, but, but, but by the way, culture is definitely on the table. Remember all the stuff about culture, gene, coevolution. Uh, but it could have happened just culturally. The, uh, the, the, thing, the, the, the model yesterday, all that it requires is kids get stuff from their parents. It doesn't matter if they get genes or if they get behavioral predispositions through teaching. Uh, and um, as I said, I did the gene stuff because I thought it was harder. That's all. Uh, yeah, way up in the back. Something troubles me about the marginal cost of a single gene economy. Isn't that a bit, a bit like saying that I could walk into a grocery store and steal an apple and the marginal cost of that apple is zero? No, because, because that's not true at all. No. Uh, the difference between an apple and a, uh, say, a song is that the cost of the apple at the store is approximately what it costs to produce the thing. And making more apples available in the store will cost approximately what the price of the apple is. Making more songs available by me giving a song to all my friends, uh, it doesn't cost anything other than, as you point out, maybe some minimal copying costs. Uh, now, marginal costs does not mean am I inflicting a harm on other pr people if I should steal it and so on. Marginal costs mean something very specific. It means what is the additional cost, meaning resources that have to be used so as to make an additional copy available. And, uh, you know, the evidence is overwhelming. The marginal cost of information goods is very, very low compared to the price. Um, so the, the Apple is not like a, uh, a, a program. Now, what you're saying is, by stealing somebody's music, I'm inflicting a cost on the author or the musician. That's true. That's true. And, and lots of other also, because if, if this goes on enough, we're, we're not going to have any songs uh, being available. Or, you know, certainly going to get that. Yeah, but, but let, let me urge you to separate your last point, which is correct, from your first point, which is not correct. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, I love to consider uh, what happens in the, in the public arena as experiments, and I'm always looking for them. Uh, I mean, the experiment has to be that there's some shock or there's some change that then you can actually see what the impact of that is, as in an experiment where you have control groups and treatments. Uh, I hadn't thought of that, however, but uh, I do it all the time. Uh, and um, uh, now I'd, I'd like to take one more question. I, um, I'm pleading a, a little bit of my own, for my own convenience. I'm, uh, I've got a plane at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning from Albuquerque, so uh, I have to get uh, I have to get down there at uh, five or something. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you. For you. Well, I'm really glad you asked that question, and I'm, gl I'm glad I called on you, but I wish I could call on all of you, because your question is exactly w what we should know, but we don't. That is, I mean, it, it's, it's quite striking. The experiments are pretty persuasive. And by the way, I'm not hiding some experiments from you. Uh, there, and this is what they say. Uh, so you would expect then, if the experimental results are so robust, that you could find in the real world cases in which You've, you have exactly that kind of thing happening. Now, the Haifa daycare was not actually an experiment, right? Uh, so it just, it's called a natural experiment because the people didn't know they were in an experiment. Uh, and uh, there are other cases like that. And so we're beginning to accumulate evidence. But as you say, the difficulty in performing experiments, or better yet, finding them like they did in Haifa, is that typically when something changes, like a new incentive or something like that, it, other things have changed too. That is, you almost never see a pure change in something without confounds. That's why we do experiments in science. Uh, and the, uh, so in, in some areas of science, it's pretty easy to draw inferences from the lab to the, to the real world. In these social science experiments, we don't yet know anywhere near enough about what's called the validity of the experiments because finding the real experiment in the world, like the Haifa daycare center, which is really pretty clean, uh, it's very hard to find. So now that's a very interpretive thing. You read case studies, you read studies, like for example, blood donations. The supposition that blood donations might be reduced by paying uh, was poo-pooed by Ken Arrow and Robert Solo, though they thought the idea was interesting. Well, now we have lots of experiments about that, and it turns out that in the, I think the best, well, there are two experiments, both suggest that there is some crowding out. Uh, in one says there's crowding out in women, but not in men, and the other says crowding out with everybody. Uh, so we're going to find out some of those things, but it's very, very slow, and in part, it's just because we're just sort of getting on top of the experimental evidence now, and we don't even really understand why it's happening, but uh, the question that you ask is the way we have to go. 
Thank you all very much. Thank you for all of your comments. Good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the finale of three Ulam lectures presented by Sam Bowles on how we got to be nasty and nice. The Ulam lectures are dedicated to the memory of mathematician Stanislav Ulam, who epitomized the kind of interdisciplinary research now conducted at the Santa Fe Institute long before the Institute was founded. I would also like to thank Dr. Penelope Penland for her generous support of the Ulam Lecture Series. And I would also like to note that her training is in psychology, and she has taken it upon herself to fund the kinds of lectures that have a psychological bent. And if anyone is interested in other types of research and isn't so inclined, um, I'm going to make a very, uh, a very, uh, yeah, a pitch um, for anyone who would like to, to contribute to the Santa Fe Institute to, to support such lectures. A small notice, many of you may also be regular attendees of Santa Fe Public Lecture Series, and I have been asked to let you know that the public lectures in October and November will not be at the regular Wednesday times. Franz de Waal from Emory University will be talking about our inner ape on Tuesday, October 7th, and Dan Gilbert from Harvard University will talk about stumbling on happiness on Monday, November 17th. Tonight's lecture is the third and grand finale of three lectures by Sam Bowles. Sam Bowles is a professor of the Santa Fe Institute where he heads the behavioral sciences program. He is also a professor of economics at the University of Siena. Sam earned his bachelor's degree at Yale in 1960 and then went to Harvard to earn his PhD in economics. So if you remember in his first lecture, he talked about worthless academic credentials as a kind of signal of an otherwise, and I quote, unobservable trait that is desirable in a co-producer or coalition partner. I think Sam knew what he was talking about. So in his first lecture, uh, well, Sam also taught economics at Harvard from 1965 to 1973 at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he is now Professor Emeritus. In his first lecture on, on Tuesday night, Sam described the unique kind of large-scale cooperation observed among humans, and why it cannot simply be explained in terms of such commonly proposed arguments as kin selection, self-interest with a long-term time horizon, or what we simply fear someone is watching us. In his second lecture last night, Sam took up the problem of explaining why humans might have such a unique propensity to cooperate, focusing on the coevolution of two kinds of behavior, altruism on the one hand, and parochialism on the other. In these lectures, Sam has exemplified the kind of research that makes you SFI such a unique place to do work. As many of you might know, academia is a place that, if not characterized by altruism, is at least parochial. <laughs> Anthropologists have their own departments, journals, conferences, and canons. Economists, sociologists, and psychologists have their own. I haven't even mentioned physicists because I'm parochial myself. In his own work, Sam has fought hard to break down these barriers. Consider the collaboration of four economists and 12 anthropologists he described in his Tuesday night lecture. Four economists and 12 anthropologists walk into a bar. <laughs> in many circles, this sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. But Sam and his colleagues made it a productive model of research, and as a result, have reinvigorated the field of cross-cultural behavioral studies. The range of collaborations required to collect and interpret the data presented in the last two lectures is astounding. Sam has digested ethnography, experimental data, archival research, hypothetical histories, game theoretic deduction, genetics, archeological data, and a preponderance of evidence, if you remember, on how people dispatched one another in prehistoric times. Recall it's a broken ulna and not a radius that indicates violent conflict. In his previous two lectures, Sam has argued that we are not always knaves, and he has proposed an explanation for this. Sometimes I think Sam's deeper motivation to study this topic is that he doesn't feel like a knave, and he doesn't like other economists telling him that he is. Whether or not we are nasty or nice is very interesting from a scientific perspective. But in the scheme of things, why does it really matter whether we are knaves or not? 
Why does it matter for policy or for how we build societies or design governments? Tonight's lecture is going to take on that challenge. From Sam's record as a reformer, and not just an academic reformer, but one who has fought the loyalty oath at Harvard in the 1960s, who debated Milton Friedman and Gary Becker, prominent Chicago school economists about free markets on public television during the Reagan era, and who has served as an economic advisor to Jesse Jackson, Robert Kennedy, Nelson Mandela, and the International Labor Organization, I suspect this is where his heart really lies. And I look forward to hearing what he has to tell us. <laughs> 16th century, in, at which time, sorry to skip over quite a bit of time there, but, uh, oh, not only that, I'm imposing a little bit of Italian on you. Um, Machiavelli said, um, uh, for anyone, I'll translate the Italian, for, for anyone who would like to uh, order a republic, um, uh, it is necessary to suppose that all men are wicked. Hunger and poverty make them industrious, and laws make them good. Uh, that's from his uh, discourses. Now, notice, Machiavelli, a genius of political science, did not say that the laws were to make the citizens be good in fact, his idea in the discourses and in The Prince, his more famous book, was that the laws should induce the citizens somehow, though bad that they are, wicked. In fact, uh, they should be induced to act as if they were good. And this then became the standard philosophical and political practical problem that the great philosophers, uh, initially Marsilio Padua, uh, uh, another Italian obviously, but this was of course then uh, taken up by uh, Hobbes uh, and Hume, who we're going to hear from again today, Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, and the great thinkers of the uh, um, European philosophical tradition. Interestingly, the person who really expressed this idea was Bernard Mandeville. He was a Dutch doctor by training. He lived in London. And in 1705, he wrote this book, Fable of the Bees. Of the bees? Why of the bees? Because what he was saying was at odds with the Aristotelian tradition, which of course was the same tradition as St. Thomas Aquinas and so on. He wanted to argue something absolutely at odds with them. And had he said that his book was about human society, he would have scandalized his readers. So he wrote about a hive of bees. He said every part was full of vice, yet the whole mass of paradise. Such were the blessings of that state, their crimes conspired to make them great. There was a hive of bees who were nasty little animals, and yet somehow the hive worked pretty well. And at a certain point, they got religion, and they all turned virtuous, and the economy of the hive crashed, and everything went to hell. Uh, <laughs> but before the religion had struck them, the worst of all, the multitude did something for the common good. And his subtitle of a later edition, actually, was Human frailties may be turned to the advantage of civil society and made to supply the place of moral virtue. Now, I want you to read history, which I think actually happened, and that is that we became this way, altruistic, because of a coevolutionary process in which both leveling, egalitarian leveling and warfare, played an essential part. Today, we're going to ask, how can we use this knowledge to improve the way we govern our local, national, and global interactions, whether in government or in business or in communities, uh, so that we can provide a flourishing and sustainable life for all humans? But I don't want to start on this. Uh, I want you to recall that last night I, I started you on... Now, I know, you have, this, you have this thing in front of you, so you're not allowed to go and turn the pages, right? Uh, uh, I told you about this um, problem the daycare centers in Haifa are having, parents coming late to pick up their kids. And uh, I told you that they posted a little sign that said, as of Monday, uh, if you come late, you'll pay a fine. And of course, being good at scientists, there was actually an experimental economist involved, two of them. Uh, they recorded before this thing started uh, how late the various groups were. This is the group that had the fine. That was the control group, which would have no fine. And the fine starts there. Um, 
And uh, you've probably spent some time wondering what happened. Uh, now, what happened actually is one of the most interesting things uh, that we've discovered in experimental economics. And if you wonder why I'm now willing to publish this work when I wasn't 20 years ago or any time in between, it's because of this fabulous outpouring of experimental work which really nailed down some of the speculations that I had back in 1988, which I was dealing with more or less mathematically in terms of sociological and psychological insight, but I was modeling it, but I just didn't have the goods. Now I think we do. But let me begin with Aristotle. Lawmakers make the citizen good by inculcating habits in them. And this is the aim of every lawgiver. If he does not succeed in doing that, his legislation is a failure. It is in this that a good constitution differs from a bad one. Not, this is one of the things you would like to see in a good constitution. This is the measure against which constitutions should be evaluated. This tradition that, that we should re regard the problem of good governance as a problem of somehow cultivating a good citizenry was an essential part of the Aristotelian idea, and it continued on in Europe up until about the 15th or 16th. Well, thank you all for thank you all for coming and uh, bearing with me this difficult and uh, demanding topic. Uh, it's actually more this topic today. What I'll be talking about today is more demanding than you might think. The first draft of what I'm talking about tonight, I wrote in 1988, the same title. Uh, and uh, I presented it at the philosophy department at University College London. It was well received by them, but not by me. Uh, but something did come of it because it was about that time that I met my wife. And she told me later that uh, that was one of the reasons why she fell in love with me, that paper. Now, of course, that worried me a lot. Because <laughs> I, I keep hoping there was something else, you know. Uh, what, you, what you see before you is a, a beautiful fresco, uh, which is on the town hall uh, in uh, Siena, Italy. And uh, this is a painting in 1338. Remember, that's... That's uh, 200 years before Machiavelli, uh, in which Lorenzetti tried to portray what a good society would look like. It's a massive fresco, and this is just a small detail. But what is absolutely striking about it is it's entirely secular. Uh, it, uh, it conveys uh, the idea of people going about their business in a well-ordered way, peacefully, productively, and so on. And so at this time, as at so many times, not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world, we've been troubled by how best are we to organize our lives so that we can live peacefully and productively together. Now, I want to review a couple of things that we've already established, I think. These are things which I would show a little picture of the hammer, not the ristra. We are a uniquely cooperative species. We join with large numbers of others, including non-kin, in the pursuit of projects for mutual benefit. A lot of, many aspects and some of the key aspects of these cooperative activities that we, we engage in cannot be explained by the self-interest paradigm or the somebody may be looking idea. Part of the explanation is because many of us are altruistic much of the time. I provided experimental evidence for that, and yet yesterday, I outlined a rather improbable hypothetical